Our speaker tonight um, has followed a really interesting and somewhat unexpected path to get to us here today. Um, she didn't start out um, her life planning to be a writer about women pirates, um, but it's funny the way things work out. She was born and raised in Texas, educated at St. John's University in New Mexico. Um, when she went to law school at Georgetown, um, she went so she went there with the intention of becoming a lawyer, not a pirate historian. Um, <laughs> But uh, this was a project that was born out of passion for her. As she was moving in between states, moving here to Virginia, she had some free time while her law license was being transferred between states, and so she started writing. She wrote articles online. Uh, literary folks started to notice the writing that she was doing, and soon the agents were calling her, asking her to write a book. Uh, the book she'll be speaking about tonight is her first book, but it won't be her last, I guarantee. Um, she's working on a companion volume now for young readers. Um, and I'm sure there will be other projects after that. Uh, when she's not writing, she's at home with her family in Harrisonburg, Virginia. But tonight, she's here with us. Please give a warm welcome to Laura Sotempo. Everyone, uh, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Uh, I want to thank you to Mark and. Um, the whole team here at the Mariners Museum for having me at this truly beautiful museum. Um, I've, I've done a few of these and this is really a, a gorgeous space. You all are very lucky to have this resource here in your community. So um, my love of pirates runs very deep. Uh, there. <laughs> so being able to share that love with such a large uh, and um, intelligent audience is a, is a real honor for me. So thanks for having me out. Uh, let's get down to business. When you think of pirate, what are some things that you think of? You might think of this guy, Captain Hook, maybe Long John Silver from Treasure Island, or even one of my personal favorites, this guy, Captain <laughs> Jack Sparrow. So all three of these men are from the golden age of piracy, which is a roughly 30 year period between 1690 and 1730, uh, when piracy was flourishing in the Caribbean. Um, when you think of pirate, you're probably thinking of a pirate from then. So these men are all from the Golden Age, and these images are all mostly wrong. Uh, <laughs> the fact that people's definition of pirate is so narrow is a large part of what led me to write this book. So for a better definition of what a pirate actually is, we're going to have to do a little bit of math, but it's nothing to be afraid of. So the sea plus something to steal equals a pirate. <laughs> this definition allows for the reality of what pirates actually were and still are across the ages, not just in the golden age of piracy, but in other eras as well. For example, here are some things that pirates are not. Let's just get this out of the way right now. Um, pirates did not bury their treasure. We don't have any <laughs> records of pirates burying their treasure. It's a story that we like to tell. Um, it's a fun birthday party activity for little children, but it just doesn't have any basis in historical fact. Uh, walking the plank, also something the pirates did not actually practice. Um, we believe that this came down from a misunderstanding of a story told by Julius Caesar, who was kidnapped by pirates, um, but it's not something that any pirates actually did, except for one that we know of. Uh, Sadie Farrell was a female river pirate, uh, Hudson River, early um, Civil War era, but she learned about it from Treasure Island. So. Uh, <laughs> um, and then pirates are not all shiver me timbers. Um, you know, we just celebrated a, a high holy day for me, a talk like a pirate day, but um, <laughs> that's just based on the portrayal of a gentleman named Robert Newton. He was Long John Silver in the 1950s uh, Disney production of Treasure Island. And he was an English guy and he talked like that. And um, you know, it came out at a fortuitous time for Disney. It was one of their first you know, live action color films and it just caught on. And so a lot of things with pirates are things that just catch on and they become true. But so those are some things, you know, parrots, actually I'm happy to report, parrots were a real thing. Pirates had them, they entertained the men on the ships and you, know, you could take, take one home from the Caribbean back to Europe and you know, sell it in the exotic market or you know, impress your girlfriend or your wife. So the parrots are real, the peg legs are real, but a lot of these other things that we think of are not. Um, but even in the golden age of piracy, this you know, sort of stereotypical age of piracy, pirates were not exactly what we think of. Pirates in the golden age had health insurance. <laughs> so no, this is really true. So um, 
when you set out on a pirate voyage, every pirate on the ship signed, an, signed the articles, the contract of, you know, this is what we're going after, this is what we hope to get, and this is the share of treasure that I'm going to take um, of whatever we get. And everybody signed off on that beforehand. And in those contracts, it had, you know, if I lose a leg, I get X many extra shares of treasure. If I lose an eye, I get X many shares of treasure. So it's really more like workers' compensation rather than health insurance. But this is a thing that was common in the golden age of piracy. Uh, pirates had religious and racial tolerance. Uh, pirate ships were fully integrated uh, well before any legitimate navy. Um, you know, they had freed slaves, uh, joined pirate ships, you know, people from many nations, they spoke many languages, and they just did not have the problems um, that the rest of society had. They were all united in their common goal of stealing things, and they were able to, you know, overcome their differences. So it's really heartwarming. But. Uh, <laughs> um, Pirates also had democratic elections. Um, you, in the contract, you had the, na the name of the captain, and during the battle, the captain's word was absolute. But afterward, if you felt that the captain had not behaved in a way that you would have liked, they, they had elections. The quartermaster could call an election, and a pirate captain could be ousted and replaced by another, um, another member of the crew. So obviously not something the British Royal Navy was doing at the same time. Um, Captain Jack Rackham, uh, we'll come back to him, but he actually got his start. He was a quartermaster under Pirate Charles Vane, and uh, they were after a French ship. Vane said, you know what, I don't think we should go up against them. They're maybe too big. You know, I don't think we're going to win that fight. And everyone says, okay, fine, but then they voted him out, and um, Jack Rackham moved up the ranks. So I think that's really interesting. Uh, gay marriage, this also, I know, what? But <laughs> it's totally true. Um, during this time period, we had there's the French word um, metellotage, and um, a pirate could couple his fortunes with another pirate. And uh, whenever one of them died, the other one received their share of the treasure. They got their their pension, um, and so there was this sort of quasi legal but sacred within the bounds of the pirate community. Um, pirate partnerships that they had uh, during this time period. Again, also not something that's going on in the Royal Navy. And finally, women in their crews. Yes, you heard right. Um, you're probably not surprised since my talk is called Pirate Women, but <laughs> there were uh, women in the pirate crews, two of the most famous ones. These ladies right here, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. Um, if you've heard of a female pirate, you've probably heard of these girls. Uh, they sailed during this time. We know about them from um, uh, court documents, their trial transcripts are all uh, still around. You can get them on the internet. Um, the Boston Gazette wrote about them with a lot of like pearl clutching well I nevers. Um, they were very popular media darlings of, of their day um, because everyone was just so fascinated by them. But we also know about them from this book. Uh, the general history of the robberies and murders of the most notorious pirates, written by someone. Uh, so the book's cover says Captain Charles Johnson. Uh, we believe this is a pseudonym. We don't have any records of Captain Charles Johnson. There was a fun period in the late 80s, early 90s where everyone thought it was a Daniel Defoe, and actually some copies of the book bear the name Daniel Defoe, but it has been pretty definitively uh, disproven that you know it was not in fact Daniel Defoe. So someone wrote this book. Uh, this is the gold standard of pirate primary sources. Um, it's been continuously in print since 1723. There have been many editions, many translations, and we just have no idea who wrote it, which uh, tells you a lot about primary sources in pirate research. <laughs> so pirates, they don't file tax returns. You know, when they get married, they don't like print their engagements in the paper. You know, by their very nature, unfortunately, they're lawless people. So they don't have very good records. So it's hard to track them down. Um, I find this quote, uh, this was very helpful to me. The legend and reality of pirate life are impossible to unravel. Um, so I, I had this above my desk when I was doing my research. Um, when doing a study of piracy, anyone who believes that they are going to strictly you know, understand what was fact and what was fiction is going to be sorely disappointed. And if someone tells you they know, they're lying to you. But, however, the why of these stories, you know, why we tell these pirate stories, why they persist. You know, they say 10% of children who dress up for Halloween every year dress up like pirates. I mean, that's kind of remarkable from something whose heyday was the 1700s. Um, so I think, you know, what we talk about when we talk about pirates is an important and fruitful field of study, if not the actual, 
you know, 100%. We know this for sure. This is how they did. But why these stories have persisted and how they've persisted and what that says about us. So here's something that we do know for sure. Um, every period in history, everywhere there were male pirates, there were women in the crews and sometimes in command. So why aren't women pirates more well known? As you might imagine, it's complicated. Um, there's explicit bias. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on misogyny in history. Um, some people and some cultures don't like women and they don't want them to be part of the story. And that's, you know, has kept them out. The ancient Greeks were very, um, the Athenians in particular, were very anti-women. So the stories we have from those times, the women's accomplishments are sort of in a footnote or swept under the rug or wrapped into somebody else's story. Um, there's inadvertent bias. Um, people write about what they know. Throughout history, most historians have been men. They write about their own experience, what they see, what they live, what they did, and the, the point of view of women are, are left out. We just don't know, not because someone had an agenda, but because women were not given the opportunity to tell the stories from their eyes. Um, and then, no blogosphere. Um, I, I got my start on the internet. I'm very grateful to the internet, but sometimes I hate the internet. You know. <laughs> The, in this era of the hot takes and the takedown and you know, somebody writing a review of a book that they've heard about and the book is panned before anyone's ever read it, you know, it's upsetting, but at the heart of the internet is a platform for formerly marginalized voices to come out and share their story, saying, I'm here, you know, maybe I don't have a six-figure book deal, maybe you, know, you, are not, you don't share anything in common with me, but this is my story, this is how I see the world, and I exist, um, and you can't, you can't erase me. And so there was no blogosphere during the time of these women pirates. So unfortunately, you know, we don't have Anne Bonny's live journal, so we have to just sort of piece things together as we can. So for all of these reasons, women pirates are often left out of the record and off of history, and this is a big mistake. <laughs> this is my pretty woman joke. I hope you like it. There are more jokes, and they're all this bad. So, <laughs> But so for three main reasons, this is a big mistake. Um, because women piracy is hi European history, women pirate history is American history, and women pirate history is world history. So when you leave women pirates out of the story, you are leaving out a huge chunk of how our world came to be in the way we understand it today. So. Women pirates history is European history. You're probably familiar with this lady. Um, so Queen Elizabeth I created the British Empire by defeating the Spanish Armada uh, with the help of her pirate friends. Uh, Queen Elizabeth took over. The British Empire was not the you know, glorious thing we think of today. And she had big dreams of how she was going to make the British Empire. But Parliament was kind of like your you know, miserable aunt at Thanksgiving and was only concerned about when she was getting married. And um, they were not interested in giving her any money, but so she hired a bunch of privateers to steal it for her. And um, the, Br the British Empire was built on the backs of this money. Uh, Sir Francis Drake, Sir John Hawkins, other people who you know and who history has re uh, remembered kindly due to their contributions started out as privateers. So a pedantic note here, a privateer is an armed p privately owned ship which is licensed to attack enemy shipping and also a sailor on such a ship. Um, lots of people use the word pirate, privateer, buccaneer, corsair um, interchangeably, and you really shouldn't. Um, they all mean very different things. We're very fussy about our pirate words. That's about the only thing we're fussy about in pirate history. But so these privateers um, were Queen Elizabeth's just little army who did her dirty work, and uh, you know Britain, as we know it, is, is in the large part a result of their work. But not all pirates of that era were under her thumb. And some of them opposed her, and one in particular shaped the destiny of not just Great Britain, but also Ireland. Queen Elizabeth met her match in the pirate Grace O'Malley. So Grace O'Malley was a woman pirate born uh, around 1530 in Ireland. This was kind of Ireland's last gasp of uh, a Celtic pagan, you know, we do our own thing area. Um, England had her eyes on it and wanted it bad, so, um, but it was still pretty wild in Grace's time. She was born into a pirating family uh, due to trading restrictions as a result of sort of civilized Ireland. Um, 
people couldn't trade directly with them, so Irish ships had to sail far away, go to Portugal, go around. There was a lot of ships sailing in the Irish Sea, and Grace's family sort of picked them off and stole their things. Um, Grace followed her dad to sea. He said, no, no girls on the ship. You know, your long hair will get in the way, and it's not safe. So she chops off all her hair and disguises herself uh, and joins her father's crew. Of course, he discovers her immediately. And she's like, you know, seven years old at the time. And <laughs> but um, he figures if she's got enough, you know, moxie to go for it, then he's going to let her stay on the ship. And it was very good for him that he did because she saved his life more than once. Um, she worked her way through two husbands and three sons. Her first husband was um, a familial marriage, a clan uh, marriage to sort of strengthen her father's position. Donal O'Flaherty. He was. Uh, Donal of the battles, the churches in the area had, you know, sort of a code on the end of their prayers, and Lord protect us from the wild O'Flaherty's. And um, he was more interested in fighting than taking care of his people, so Grace sort of ran everything under the table, and everyone knew if you needed something, you went to Grace. Uh, when Donal was killed, uh, she went to take over in earnest of their, of their clan and was told she couldn't do that because she was a woman, and she said, enough of this land business, I'm going back to be a pirate, and she was for the rest of her days. Um, she married Richard Bork uh, because he had a very nice castle that was right on the sea and a good base for her sailing. Uh, in, in Gaelic custom, at the time, you could marry someone for one year certain and then divorce them on your one-year anniversary with no penalties. So legend has it that you know Richard was riding back on their anniversary and she yelled from the turret, you know, Richard Burke, I dismiss you. And um, he sort of you know shrugged and went on his way. I think he expected it, but. They remained friends uh, through the rest of his life, and she got to keep the castle. So, um, so Richard Bingham was the governor of Ireland at this time, Queen Elizabeth's man, who uh, Grace was a particular thorn in his side. They played cat and mouse over a period of like 10, you know, 15 years. And uh, Bingham was just, had just had it with Grace and the you know, rebellious Irish spirit that she represented. And he kidnapped her two oldest sons, and actually had one of them executed. And when her youngest son, with her um, second husband, Richard, was kidnapped, Grace realized that she was not getting out of this one, and she knew she had to do whatever it took to protect her son, you know, as any mother would. So she wrote a letter to Queen Elizabeth and explained why she got into piracy, sort of you know, painted a rose-colored picture of her life and the, why she did what she did, and, and requested that her son be returned to her, that you know, Bingham had it out for her, this was not his fault, and he needed to be returned home to his mother. When Grace didn't get an answer, she sailed to Greenwich herself, um, knowing very well that she could be hanged and you know, would maybe never see home again. But she requested an audience with the queen, and it was granted. Uh, we do not have official records of what happened during this conversation. I mean, my god, if I had a time machine, I could go back and infiltrate this meeting. But uh, we don't know what happened, what was said, but we do know the result, which was that Toby was given back to Grace. Grace was allowed to return home and continue her pirating in peace. And Richard Bingham was recalled um, to England in disgrace. So um, these two women who had a lot in common about making it in the man's world, the man's profession, were able to come to an understanding. Um, and then Grace died in 1603, the same year as Queen Elizabeth. So here's a picture of Rockfleet Castle. It doesn't look like much now, but I'm told that you know, it was worth marrying Richard for. And here is um, a woodcut of, uh, this, this is from the time period um, of you know, the Pirate Queen and the Virgin Queen. And one can only imagine the conversations they had. So, women pirate history is also American history. So the golden age of piracy happened, as I said before, you know, 1690, 1730. Every different book you read will have a different definition of exactly when it was, but we all agree there were a bunch of pirates at the same time, the same place in the Caribbean. And when you think of the Pirates of the Caribbean, you probably think of this like I do. Um, it's no shame. Uh, I've ridden the ride myself probably 60 times. Uh, but, but the golden age of piracy is so much more than the ride at Disney. So why the Caribbean? There's a lot of reasons why the golden age of piracy happened at this time. Um, some of them geographical, some of them political. It's kind of a perfect storm of everything being in the right place at the right time. But a big reason 
uh, for it is the, the rise of the triangle trade. Unfortunately, you can't talk about the golden age of piracy without talking about the slave trade. Uh, slaves are brought from Africa to plantations in the Caribbean. It was a good stopping point. You went from Africa to the Caribbean to the colonies back to Europe and um, it's sort of the hypotenuse of the triangle and um, a lot of money was being made with this transportation of slaves and the pirates, you know, where there's money, there's pirates. Um, also, the colony fever, um, Spain, because of a papal declaration, had gotten, you know, the, you know, South America and uh, France and Flanders and England wanted in on the action. You know, Spanish gold, you know, Aztec gold, Mayan gold, was being taken, you know, shipfuls back to Spain and everybody else was like, well, I want gold too. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, political instability as colonies changed hands. Jamaica, Haiti, um, you know, Tortuga, they're all changing hands as people are fighting for who's in charge of it and who gets those colonies, which meant there was not a lot of political stability, not a lot of long-term governance going on. And so the pirates were able to take advantage of that. So the two female pirates were, as we said before, are we, are we here? Okay, sorry, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. So they actually have very uh, interesting and kind of similar childhood backstories. Um, okay, Mary Reed was born in England, um, and her mother passed her off as her dead brother for inheritance money. Um, <laughs> She had a son with her husband, and then her husband died, and then she had another child. Uh, so not with her husband. But um, uh, she was collecting money for the upkeep of the child from her uh, ex-husband's family. And then, uh, tragically, her son died, but Mrs. Reed needed that money, and so she figures, why don't I just pass off a daughter for a son? And, you know, erases her daughter's identity, and she lives her early childhood dressed as a boy. Um, she remains dressed as a boy through her next several jobs. Um, she was an astonishingly industrious and apparently talented woman. She worked as a footboy, she was in the army, she was in the navy, she was in several armies and navies and received a lot of training and fought in several wars. She fell in love with her tent mate in Flanders and who was very relieved to find out that that you know, good looking young man was actually a good looking young lady. Uh, <laughs> they were married and set up a tavern in um, present day Holland uh, and thought they'd live out their days happily ever after but unfortunately he died uh, soon after the, uh, the War of Spanish Succession ended and business dried up. So she once again donned her men's clothing and set off on a ship to the Caribbean hoping to seek her fortune. Her ship was captured by pirates. Um, and she was, since she was dressed as a man, she was not ransomed uh, like the other women were, but she was given the opportunity to join the crew, which she did. Um, and around this time is when she met Anne Bonny. Uh, Anne Bonny was also um, an illegitimate child. She was born in Ireland, um, the son of her, the daughter of, <laughs> her father and one of her mother's uh, maids. And um, her father wa was very fond of her and wanted her in the household. So she, he dressed her up like a boy and said, oh, this is like a country cousin. I'm training him to be a lawyer. So she was also dressed up as a boy. But her mom cottoned on a lot faster than Mary Reed's grandparents. And uh, she kicked them all out. So dad, maid, and Anne were sent uh, to the colonies to start their life over again in Carolina. Um, her mother died soon after, and Anne became the mistress of her father's uh, plantation. He was actually a very successful uh, businessman. He, got, he has like all the luck. Uh, and he, um, uh, she was known for her fiery temper. Um, she, uh, a, a, a prospective suitor got a little too friendly with her when she was about 13, and she beat him so badly he was in bed for like weeks. Um, which I, I don't blame her to be honest, but you know, um, she um, there are rumors that she burned her father's house down. There, um, you know, which there there was a fire, but we don't know that she caused it. But so she ran the house um, with her capricious whims. Um, but despite of that, her father adored her and wanted her to marry a well-to-do businessman, which would, you know, improve his fortunes, and she decided she wanted nothing to do with that. She marries this two-bit sailor, James Bonney. Father is heartbroken and dis disinherits her, and they head off for the Caribbean. So th this is where she meets Jack Rackham. I mentioned him earlier. Um, Jack Rackham is a 
ultimately kind of a small time pirate. Um, I think his biggest claim to fame is knowing uh, Anne Bonny and Mary Read. He probably would kind of be lost if not for having these two women on his crew. He was um, a flashy dresser, sort of like you know the Kanye West of the pirate set. <laughs> but he, um, he met Anne and by all accounts immediately fell in love with her. Um, there's a, you know, the quote in the Johnson is like, he you know, wooed her like he would take a ship, you know, like coming right up along broadsides and no hesitation. Like, you know, so so they, 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 they fell in love. Um, and uh, actually, Rackham offered to buy her off of her husband, which is apparently a way they got around adultery. It was a kind of a common practice. You could just buy somebody's wife. Uh, but James Bonney didn't go for it and wanted to have them both hanged for adultery, so they had to make a quick uh, getaway to Cuba for a while, um, where Anne reportedly had uh, Rackham's child. But as soon as she had her baby, she was back on the ship, and that's where she met Mark Reed, this new pirate, and they became fast friends. And um, she, Mark was discovered to be Mary when Jack was jealous that his you know, lover was spending all this time with this other male pirate, and you know, what is the deal? And finally they were like, we're both girls, it's okay. Like it's <laughs> um, so they had a very eventful summer and fall of 1720. Um, it seems that these two women on the crew really you know, spiced things up. They were much more successful than they had been previously. Uh, they stole a sloop, the William, right out from under the governor's nose in Nassau, which was kind of you know, the beginning of the end. He issued a, a warrant for their arrest. That's another you know, validation that we know these women are real because there was you know, an arrest warrant. Um, and they were ultimately captured in October of 1720. Um, stories goes that Anne and Mary were a watch on deck, the men were below playing cards and drinking, um, the ship was boarded, and uh, the women fought them off ferociously. Um, they, even say, they say that Mary Reed shot her gun down into the hold and was like, somebody come up here and help us out. Um, but the men were all too drunk or too scared, and um, the women held the men off as long as they could, but they were ultimately all captured. Um, the men were tried first for piracy. Um, they were all tried and uh, convicted of piracy. And Jack asked for one tender goodbye with his love, uh, Anne Bonny, before he was taken to the gallows. And he was taken to her cell. And she said that she was sorry to see him there, but if he had fought like a man, he would not now die like a dog. <laughs> So I like to think he went to the gallows smiling. I mean, you know, I think he knew Anne and she was not gonna like cry over him, but still, I mean, that's some stone cold like sass right there. And I, I just love it. Um, so Anne and Mary were tried a few days later. Um, many people spoke at their trial and testified like, yes, they were women. Yes, we all knew they were women. And yes, they were nasty, dirty pirates. They shot, they had swords. They, you know, were saying we should kill all these people. And, you know, which they probably should have because they ended up testifying at the trial. So, um, they, you know, no one listens to them. Um, but um, so they were also they were both convicted of piracy as well, and um, sentenced to death. But after their sentence, both women um, said that they were pregnant and could they please get a commutation of their sentence until their children were born. Um, they were examined by a doctor and both found to be pregnant. So they were put in jail. Um, Mary Reed died a few months later, um, possibly of uh, prison fever. She may have died in childbirth, but there's records that Mary Reed did die in prison. And Bonnie, we don't know. Um, there are many theories about what happened to her. Um, it's possible that she died in prison as well, although we, with such a notorious pirate, it probably would have been in a record. Um, some people say that her father um, managed to spring her and she, you know, went home to North Carolina and lived a quiet life, um, you know, remarried. Um, some people say that Bartholomew Roberts, um, you know, had a heist and, you know, sprung her from prison and, and she continued pirating. That's my personal favorite theory. I think that she probably would have preferred the gallows to, you know, sitting room in North Carolina, you know, doing embroidery. <laughs> but um, the fact of the matter is we just don't know what happened to her. So, um, but, uh, aside from these other two well-known women, there is another sneaky um, American history tied to pirates, and then no less of a lofty institution as the United States Marines. So we all know the song, you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Well, the shores of Tripoli, ladies and gentlemen, is talking about pirates. Um, the Barbary Corsairs were the scourge of the Mediterranean. 
Um, they were pirates that were absolutely terrifying. Most ships just surrendered when they realized they were coming, that the Corsairs were coming on them because they had this reputation for ruthlessness that absolutely preceded them. Um, they were said to kidnap entire towns in the night. They'd just come in and take everyone away and enslave them. You know, they were enslaving Christians, and so obviously Europe was not cool with that and um, had a lot to say, although the enslaving of Africans was just A-OK, -okay, but you know, when you're going to Europe and enslaving Europeans, you, can't, you cannot do that. So um, these Barbary Corsairs demanded tribute money from nations to avoid being uh, attacked, and they collected it from the colonies, and then when America became the United States of America, they demanded that money as well. Uh, Thomas Jefferson decided he was done uh, paying tribute money, and plus there was no money because they just won the Revolutionary War, so he um, beefed up the Navy to go after the Barbary menace. Um, People say, you know, he created the Navy to fight the pirates, and that's not exactly true. Um, the Navy did exist before this time, but uh, not really in this form. This is kind of the beginnings of like the modern Navy that we know today, and that was, you know, um, done to fight the Barbary menace. Uh, but many years before Thomas Jefferson got into it with them, there was a legendary female corsair, uh, Barbary corsair Saida Alhara. So. Uh, which brings me to my, my last point, uh, that women pirate history is world history. So Saeed al -Hara, like so many women pirates, uh, we don't actually know her name. Uh, this was her title. Um, it means a, you know, a noble lady who is free and independent. She was the last um, of the um, Muslim rulers to, to hold this title. Um, she was born in Andalusia, part of you know, present-day Spain around 1485. Um, as a result of Ferdinand and Isabella's Reconquista, she and her entire Moorish family was um, forced to flee uh, Europe and head to the northern coast of Africa. And um, her family settled in Morocco. Um, so she was a refugee as a child and she never forgot, um, and her family never forgot um, the, the indignities that they had suffered at the hands of um, the Catholic Church. So she was married um, as a young woman to um, Abu Hassan al-Mandri, who was the governor of their new hometown of, in Tatuana, Morocco. Um, despite the fact he was significantly older, it was by all accounts a harmonious marriage, if not a love match. Um, he really relied on her uh, to help him in his business dealings, and she sort of ruled um, Tetuan side by side by him. And when he passed away, she took over um, outright and um, ruled Tetuan. So Tetuan was not a super nice place to live, and she decided that she wanted to build a beautiful city for her uh, fellow refugees, and what better way to do that than by stealing money from Europe. Uh, so she uh, allied with the famous Barbarossa brothers. You may have heard of the Barbarossa pirates. Um, the name itself is uh, a mystery. It may be a misunderstanding of um, the, the gentleman's name, it was Ar Aruj, and uh, Baba, you know, an honorific, so Baba Rouge, Barbarossa, it could be Red Beard in Italian, we don't even know, you know, like so many things in the Barbary Corsairs, there's so many layers of like Islamophobia and, um, you know, lost in translation that um, even in pirate history, the Corsair history is particularly oblique. But so the Bar with the Barbarossas, they ruled the Eastern Mediterranean, she ruled the Western Mediterranean, and together they had the whole darn thing. Um, uh, she is uh, known as the undisputed pirate queen of the Mediterranean. Um, the reason we know about her is because of the name of all the people whom uh, she dealt with. The, um, the Portuguese have her in, in, in the record, you know, ship lost to Saeed al -Hura. You know, so um, she is written up in other parts of the world um, because of the damage that she, that she did. Um, and you know, Tetuan is now a, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and there are beautiful things there um, that, that, that come from the, the, the work that she did. Um, she married the Sultan um, of Fez, um, Ahmed al-Watasi. She had met him um, as the you know, governor of uh, Tetuan and appealed to him for help, and apparently they fell in love, and he was absolutely smitten with her. Um, and this is in her you know, 40s, by the way. This is her second marriage. And um, she demanded that uh, he come to her. She was not going to Fez to get married. She was too busy. Um, and the king needed to come to her if he wanted to get married, which he did. Uh, it's the only time in the history of Morocco that a king left the capital city for, uh, to be wed. And um, 
So that's, that's very exciting. I like that part of the story. <laughs> it's, you know, it's nice to see a, an older woman, you know, get, get married a, as well. You know, life isn't over. Uh, <laughs> but she, um, so she was deposed by her son-in-law, uh, one of El Mandri's son, um, and disappears completely from the record in 1542. We don't know what happened to her. Um, but um, she was a you know, ferocious pirate queen and not just a, a lady pirate, but a lady pirate of color. And so, um, her story particularly captivates me and one that I think needs to be shared. Um, so this is a, a Corsair galley and I just wanted to show you um, their ships because I think they're really cool. Uh, <laughs> so the big ship on the right, I think this is, a, I don't know, the, yeah, oh yeah, there we go. So this big one here is what you think of when you think of a pirate ship. Um, you know, these are like the movie pirate ships, that's a, a French ship. But this little guy right here, this is the Corsair galley. Um, pirates never had the money, so they never had the gunpower of the navy ships. So the way pirates took their prey is by being faster. Um, so as you can see, the ship is smaller, it's way more maneuverable, they can just zip up, board, take everything, sail out. Um, it has oars, which, okay, yes, that's, that's the ship. Uh, <laughs> and then you can see, um, the oars. Um, the other ships from the, um, the northern Africa were also rowed, but they were rowed by slaves. Uh, the pirate ships were rowed by free men, and so they said that the pirates were more effective because free men are always going to fight harder for their freedom in battle than the slaves. Um, but I just think that's interesting that, you know, pirate ships take so many forms uh, throughout the ages and only in a very tiny bit of time do they look even close to, you know, this like French or English ship. Uh, so speaking of England, when you think of England, when I think of England, I think of something like this. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, so, and, uh, and, and this. So, you know, uh, uh, so I'm here to tell you that England's lust for tea, Chinese tea to be exact, um, created the greatest pirate of all time. Chang'e Sao. So Britain was importing so much tea from China that their import-export balance was totally out of whack because they just had this like lust for tea and all the tea was coming in and nothing was coming out. So they felt that it would be important to create an export so valuable that they could even the scales a little bit and so Britain sent uh, opium to China. I'm not going to go into the opium wars. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a much longer topic for a much uh, more erudite person than myself. <laughs> but suffice it to say, um, the opium wars created the environment that allowed um, Cheng Yi Sao, the greatest pirate of all time, to flourish. So here is an alleged image of Cheng Yi Sao. Um, so yes. I, I buried the lead there. The most successful pirate of all time was a woman, and I can back this up. Um, she had a fleet of 1,200 uh, men, or 1,200 ships. She had anywhere from between 40,000 to 70,000 pirates under her command, bigger than many navies of her time. Uh, you know, we think of like Blackbeard. He had like a dozen ships. You know, he was active for a couple of years. Um, but we just love to love Blackbeard. But Cheng Isao makes him look like a little boy with like bath, you know, boats in the bathtub compared to what she was able to accomplish. So when I found out about her, I was so mad. I was like, all right, I'm writing this book because everyone needs to know about Cheng Isao. Little little children should dress up like Cheng Isao, not Blackbeard. Um, <laughs> But so this is, yeah, this is um, the, the picture that gets used most often um, to, to um, illustrate her, which is better than, uh, she actually appeared in a Disney Pirates of the Caribbean movie where she looked like this. Um, by the way, the fact that there was a female pirate named Mistress Ching in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie is probably the most accurate part of the Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean movie. <laughs> I'm not hating, I love them, but you know, they're, they're, they're not historical documents. Uh, <laughs> So Cheng Isao, oh my goodness, there we go, sorry. Um, Cheng Isao was born in um, you know, present-day Canton around 1775. Um, she was a prostitute, she worked on a flower boat, so the Chinese government didn't want uh, prostitutes on land, but it was okay to have them in the water. And so they had these little pleasure boats and you kind of, you sailed your boat up to their boat, you went on, you did your business, you, you know, sailed away. Um, one of her customers was Cheng Yi, who was a pirate. 
Um, and in 1801, they got married. There are lots of fun stories about you know, their, uh, his proposal and how they got together, but um, we know that they were married in 1801 and they spent their honeymoon in Vietnam fighting the Thay Son Rebellion. Um, what they learned in Vietnam was that when a bunch of little pirates got together, you had a big fighting force and you could do a lot more with a big uh, you know, a league of pirates than you could with each individual outfit. So they brought that home and decided, well, why don't we do that in China? And they had begun to establish this fleet um, in 1807 when Chang Yi passes away. Um, he may have been killed in battle, he may have been swept overboard in a uh, tsunami, we don't know for sure. But when that happened, Chang Yi Sao, which again, Chang Yi Sao means wife of Chang Yi. We don't know her real name either, um, which you know, makes me sad. But um, she takes over the fleet. Uh, so a woman taking over for her husband is not entirely unheard of, but of a fleet of such magnitude, it really is. Um, but she did it in a very savvy way. She first, before she made her move, she checked with all of Cheng Yi's surviving relatives and got their blessing, so that none of them would, you know, stand up against her. And she appointed as the commander of the Red Flag Fleet, which was her you know, the biggest fleet in her confederation. She had red flag, green flag, black flag, yellow flag. Um, the red flag fleet, she puts Cheng Pao, who is her uh, adopted son. Um, and then she marries him. So she's got complete control. Now that's not as sketchy as it sounds because um, in, in China at this time, uh, familial relationships are everything. You know, everything gets passed down through the family. But um, the Chengs did not have a child, so they adopted a young man who was you know, closer to their own age and brought him up as their son in order to have an heir. But um, he was not like, you know, like a five-year-old boy and she married him. You know. um, but so we, we leave that for uh, Woody Allen. But um, so I know cheap shot, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so mad. Uh, but so anyway, so Cheng Pao is the head of the Red Flag Fleet, so she's got a direct line to the head of all of the fleets. Um, and what she does is she expands everything exponentially and she rules them all with an iron fist by her code of laws. Um, now, as I mentioned before, many pirate ships had a contract, they had the rules, um, but hers were really interesting um, in that they were fleet wide, not you know, ship by ship. And um, her penalties were incredibly harsh. It was, you know, you leave your post. Uh, during battle, you get your ear cut off. You do it again, you you die. You know, you disobey an order, you die. Like it's, it was a lot of death. You know, the sort of death theme. You know, you disobey Cheng Yi Sao, you die. Um, and if you rape a female captive, you die. Um, this is a wholly new thing in the pirate code. Um, there's not a lot of provisioning for women. Um, Bartholomew Roberts had a you know any women on board are are, are punished by death, but this is protecting uh, the women on board now. Um, some scholars say it has more to do with control. She just wanted to make sure she knew what the men were doing and who they were doing it with and you know, keeping order on her ship. But the fact remains is that she had this very sort of progressive notion in this code that she's famous for. Um, like I said before, at the height of her operation, 40,000 to 70,000 pirates, depending on the source, 1,200 ships. Um, this is larger than many navies at the time, including China. Um, she was an absolute terror. Um, no one could stop her. China tried many times. Um, they set up these, you know, progressively more cartoonish traps for her. Um, you know, and they sat there like gleefully, like, ah, we have her now. And she got out of them every single time. Um, you know, they set ships on fire and sent them into her fleet, hoping that it would, you know, catch all the other ships on fire. And like the wind would change and blow it away. And, you know, she had this, this incredible skill and a good bit of luck. Um, she was so successful that she had like, uh, like internal revenue offices on land. She had to have like banks to put all of the money that they were stealing, like to keep track of it. So she had this like land operation as well as her sea operation. Um, China reached out to Portugal, China reached out to England um, for help. And you know, more and more people sending her ships, no one can touch her. So Cheng Sao decides that she's done with piracy. She's going to get out while the going's good, while she's still on top. So she goes to the Chinese government officials and says, listen, I'm gonna retire and here's what it's gonna take and you're gonna give me all these things. So you just let me know when you're ready to give me everything I ask for. Um, and they do, because they have no other option. So she negotiated this absolutely 
like Looney Tunes crazy incredible settlement for her men. Um, out of the 70,000 men, like a little over 100 were executed. Most of them were set free. Many of them were given positions in the army uh, and the navy because of their you know, sailing skills. Um, she was allowed to keep a big fleet for herself for her own personal use. Chang Pao, her husband, was given um, a plum posting in the army. And my very favorite part, the government set up a fund for uh, to help these pirates transition to civilian life, you know. <laughs> so they're getting government payouts to stop being pirates. The governments are paying their retirement fund. And this is just absolutely unparalleled in history. And so, I mean, am I right? Like, Cheng Yi Sao is the greatest pirate ever, um, male or female. And so, um, but uh, we don't know exactly how she spent uh, her last years. Um, some say she ran a brothel of her own. Some say she opened a casino. Uh, but she died in age 69 uh, in 1844. We don't, like I said, we're not sure exactly what she did. But I like to think it was something kind of like this uh, <laughs> towards the end of her life. But uh, all joking aside, um, there are so many um, other women pirates. Um, I'm not covering any more. You know, we're almost done. <laughs> so, uh, so many more women pirates than I've covered here, and those are just the ones we know about. Um, many pirate historians, you know, Marcus Redeker, Angus Constum, say that, you know, untold women lived and died as men on pirate ships, and we will never know um, how many women actually served on pirate ships. These are just the ones who got caught um, or came out and lived as women. So my hope is, as people hear these stories and you know, these stories get around, that uh, people start to look for more women pirates in, in stories. Because you know, once you start looking, they're, they're everywhere. Um, because these stories are important, um, these women chose their own destiny. And they pursued their dreams in fields where people told them that they didn't belong. Um, I don't think it's too wild of a leap to go from pirates to Oh, I skipped this slide. I'm sorry. There's, there's a bad joke. You're welcome. I skipped it. So um, it's not too, uh, too wild a leap to go from a pirate to, you know, Katherine Johnson, the woman who helped John Glenn, you know, sent John Glenn to the moon. Alice Guy Blachet, the first director of feature films, the first female director, and even the meme creator and Supreme Court Justice, Notorious RBG. Um, so every woman, every person, deserves a role model who inspires them to go after whatever it is they desire, however unconventional. And my hope in sharing these stories is that these pirates can be that for someone else, as they clearly are for me. So thank you very much. <laughs> to Grace O'Malley and Anne Bonny. Grace was the Irish pirate that clocked me, Elizabeth. Yes, she's she the one I'm speaking of. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, your origin, in your opening comments about her, or along in the recitation, I'm sorry, you said she wrote a letter to Queen Elizabeth. That is what really got me, my mind blowing. Did it, was it common for education, uh, especially of women, at the time she lived, to be able to read and write? Um, not so much. Um, you know, she was a, a chieftain's daughter, and she had some opportunities that um, were maybe not available. Um, given that the uh, Christian church had not taken over Ireland, women actually had it a little better over there than they did in England during that time. Um, I mean, it's, just, it's true. <laughs> but um, to, to um, certainly, even if they could read and write, people were not sending you know, directives to, to Queen Elizabeth. So it is really extraordinary that she was able to do what she did and get the result that she wanted, so. Is the evidence demonstrating that the letter was in her hand or dictated by her to someone else who did the writing? I, and is there actually yeah. letter? Um, someone has the letter because I, I read it in my research. Someone asked me this the other day. I don't remember um, where I saw it. Um, Anne Chambers is the chief biographer of 
uh, Grace O'Malley, and she, I mean, if anyone has it, she probably has it, and she probably has the answers to those questions. I just don't have them for you. And I'm not enough of a pirate to lie. I, I wish I could make it up for you, but I, I just don't know. So. <laughs> Thank you. That was very informative and very exciting. My first thought, uh, verifying the figures of the Chinese pirate, 1,200 ships, 40 to 70,000 of crew. A, where did she park 1,200 ships? <laughs> and B, how did she manage the lives of 40 to 70,000 people? Are the, is there verification for those figures? Um, there, there is verification for those figures. We, um, you know, the the primary source documents exist. Um, many of them are in Chinese, so I have to rely on the translations from both the sources at the time, and also um, there is a leading Chinese South scholar, Diane Murray, um, who has, you know, who speaks Chinese and has translated these documents. Um, she managed them from shore. I mean, this is a constant. Um, you know, keeping that many people fed and clothed and managed her ship. I mean, she did it through her her fleet commander, so you know they had meetings. Um, and you know, China is a big place. You know, the, the China Sea is a big place, and so the ships were not frequently not parked. They were usually out stealing things and raiding people and you know, <laughs> making making money. But so um, there were there were frequent meetings of of the commanders of the, of the fleets that were able to um, you know get provisions and stuff. But she did have a su substantial land operation to back up her sea operation and. Um, many of the people in the coastal areas in order to avoid being raided by her sold her you know goods and produce for you know very re reasonable rates and so um, she was able to sort of keep everybody fed and, and happy with the um, the cooperation of the people uh, the coastal people on land i hope that answers your question close enough okay anyone else if it comes to you you can ask me at the signing table I, i'm not going anywhere so You uh, mentioned earlier of the uh, democracy uh, amongst pirate crews. Is that only common in golden age pirate crews, or is that also common in the fleets of uh, of, of, of the crew, of the uh, Chinese and uh, Barbary pirates? Um, it's more common in the golden age. Um, it's um, there was a movement right before the Golden Age, sort of the, the buccaneer movement, and um, we had the Brethren of the Coast, and that was sort of the beginning of this pirate democracy, this pirate utopia thing. Um, the articles were fairly constant, like people did know what they were getting into, but um, we don't, I, I can't say for sure that it was as, as widespread um, outside of the area of the Golden Age, but it was definitely, you know, throughout time that, that there was a lot more, you know, equal rights in, in the pirate ships than in, in the navies. Um, sorry to second that point, but is that coming from the movements coming out of the English Civil Wars, like the levelers um, and the ranchers, or is it just completely whole cloth made up by the pirates, um, or even now? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know a whole bunch about English history that doesn't have pirates in it, so. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's interesting to me that a lot of these women, early in their life, were identified in, as men or in male roles. Mm -hmm. And they seemed to be put in that role, and then they moved into roles of authority and power. Has, has any of your research commented on the fact that it was more environment than sex that drove them to these things? Well, I have definitely seen research about, um, you know, the robust tradition of cross-dressing at sea. Um, you know, the British Navy, at, at, you know, at, at one point was estimated to be, you know, half women dressed like men and half men. It, so um, it's not just pirates where women dressed up like men and went to sea. It's in legitimate navies as well. Um, but as far as anyone explicitly saying, you know, like, well, they put on pants and that's how they became good pirates. Like, um, the women, like Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed dressed as women on the ship. They were known as women. Many of these other um, 
figures were, were, were out as women, you know. So um, I, don't, I don't think there's a, 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 I don't think you can make a link between, you know, wardrobe and um, sailing skills. I think there's, you know, something else going on there. Do you have any uh, idea of the sharing of the treasures of the ship by Queen Elizabeth? Uh, I've heard you get as much as 20% of the loot from a ship. Uh, how about the captain and the senior mates? Would they get a, a greater percentage than, say, one share of each uh, of the ship? Um, it really depended ship to ship. Um, I mean, they, they got... Um, I mean, I've seen one where, like, the captain gets 10, and the carpenter gets 8, and the doctor gets 6, and so, um, you know, uh, for the privateers in particular, a goodly amount went back to the crown. That's why they were able to to get away with this, you know, legal pirating. But um, um, the pirates still made out pretty well. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't do it. So um, the the share of treasure was. Uh, the, I don't. Ha there are no records that I'm aware of of people complaining that you know Queen Elizabeth got more than she deserved. So. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you so much.